We are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are uh, both going to be reviewing uh, Talk Radio from 1988, the film, which was directed by Oliver Stone and written by Eric Bogosian. It was also adapted uh, from his the play that Eric Bogosian wrote off-Broadway, and it stars Eric Bogosian. And we have one of the lead actors who was in the film uh, today, Leslie Hope, who played uh, Laura. Well, thanks so much again, Leslie, for joining me today. Thank you for asking me, Robert. Nice to be here. Yeah, no, always a pleasure. I was, so you, I, I saw on Twitter, you said you watched it again the other night. Uh, what was that like? <laughs> well, let me just tell you, I was, I was challenged to, to find it. I might be the last person on the planet that knows that, found out that iTunes doesn't work in the same way anymore. So once I couldn't go through the regular iTunes route, um, I tried Google Play, couldn't figure that out. Tried Voodoo six times, can't get a password to work, couldn't figure that out. Um, I had designed from Amazon in protest, you know, about a year or so ago, but now yeah. it was the only option. So I, uh, after I spent too much time on YouTube, sort of trying to find little bits and I would just get old trailers or other interviews that had happened. So I, I, I relented for you and went back to <laughs> uh, and watched I appreciate so, that. <laughs> <laughs> I all my, all, all my sort of principles away to do the podcast. Um, anyway, so I, it, Part one was trying to find it. And I was surprised, actually. I thought, because of Oliver, certainly, and some of those cast members, I thought it might be an easier access to get to that movie. It kind of reminded me that it was not um, one of his, well, I think it's a terrific film. It wasn't, I guess, one of his big hits or anything it was considered at the time a smaller movie. Um, and I was surprised that it took me a while to get to it. That being said, wow, walk down memory lane, Robert. Holy. <laughs> yeah. No, I bet. And, uh, I, you know, it used to, it used to be on, uh, it was on Netflix for quite a while because I was looking for it myself and I, and the same thing, I couldn't find it. And I used to have it on VHS. Uh, I'm not sure. It might still be at my parents' house, but, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I haven't seen, I, I, yeah, but I had the same, uh, experience. I had to, I had to hunt for it a little bit, but you're right. It's a shame because it is such a, I, I honestly think it's one of the best films he did. Uh, Oliver Stone, uh, but what did you, so what did you think of it then? And, and what did you think of it now? Was it different or did you have the same reaction? For sure, for sure different. I mean, it's what, 30 something years ago, right? That we made that movie. Um, so, I mean, I'm just myself, I'm just a different person. I'm sure everybody involved in the movie is in some way different from all that time ago. But I was, um, I was struck by how prescient it was. I mean, talk radio at the time was certainly blooming. I mean, the, it's not only based on a play, but also uses um, as, let's say, inspiration, if that's the right word, of the Allen Berg, who was the uh, talk show host who was uh, killed. Um, and it, it was a real um, prescient sort of um, indicator of where not just radio, but television and everything else was going. The, the amount of vitriol that was sort of spewed in that film from incoming listeners, the stuff that was cut, the shock jock kind of stuff that was coming out of Bogosian's character, provoking for the sake of provoking, all the get ratings, all that stuff that we sort of, I think, take for granted now. At the time, it was maybe unusual and not so, not so prevalent. So that was one thing was like, holy cow, we re we're here now every day on Twitter, on any kind of social media, on regular television. Like that's how people are speaking to each other. So that was part one that I noticed. And um, uh, on a personal level, I was like, wow, were we ever that young? Look at Alec Baldwin. He looks like a little baby man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, um, Eric, who uh, goes the way, the privilege of working with, you know, years later, which is even now about 10 years ago on, um, on Law and Order and Criminal Intent. I just look at him in that movie and he was like, well, not only was he beautiful, but so young, not that he's so old now, forgive me, Eric, if you're listening, but just <laughs> that we were all like, you know, in our twenties, maybe thirties in that movie. Um, and that just that sort of energy that comes along with that. I, it'd be interesting to see if, you know, you put all, all of us actors back together again now, what the vibe would be in terms of, how we interacted and what we felt we needed to say or how we felt we needed to be seen. So on a personal level, that was a bit of a, a field trip for me. <laughs> like, um, 
a weird science experiment. Like, oh my God, I haven't seen it since it came out. Um, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. So. Just just before we go on, is my uh, audio okay for you? It was yeah okay because yeah. it was uh, it's you're you're okay now, but for the first um, minute or so, it was very. Uh, if anyone in the audience is uh, listening, it was it was it was very um, scratchy, but it seems to have straightened up. Okay. Um, but I heard I heard I got the gist. I, I just caught what you said in terms of uh, the film. Very yeah, that's true. Very much in, uh, about you know the media and how we the way people talk to each other on, on the internet, particularly about, you know, politics and, you know, being just flat out rude and disrespectful and, and obnoxious and hateful. And hateful. Yeah. yeah. And, hateful and, and, you know, in the, under the cloak of darkness then, which was to say radio. So no face to go with it. You could call in and spew these terrible things yeah. and be heard in a way. Um, but almost anonymously and I, I i think now i mean it's it's interesting that you it's hard to be you can still do it under the cover thinking that you are anonymous you're much more easily trackable right or traceable or cancelable or any of those things right. but um they weren't dealing with so much in that movie i don't think uh, uh as much a political thing as um, hatred and um prejudice and anti-Semitism and yeah. and all these, you know, it was, it was something to see, to see it again and, and something to, to recognize how ahead of the curve Oliver was with, and Eric Bogosian for sure, with their, their take on what was happening at that time, 30 something years ago. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it, it, it's that, that really stood out to me as well. I mean, I've seen it a number of times, but I, I, I hadn't seen it in a while and uh, as much as I, I really notice the uh, elements of the media and how relevant that is now, um, it just his character of, of Barry Champlain. Um, I, I just saw the the dangers of of his ambition and his self destructiveness yeah. and his his need to have an audience at all cost, yeah. uh, and and how he destroyed his relationship with his wife and even the relationship he has with with you as your character uh uh laura and 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 everything is about you know ratings and and success yeah. and he's sort of is playing this persona you know just before howard stern you know that uh shock jock radio uh and of course you know he's not he's not enjoying any of this they're actually terrifying him uh yeah. i mean god i mean those threats and but he's you know bogosian played it so well in terms of just covering up how he really felt until that monologue at the end. But, you know, just with his sarcasm and his humor and his obnoxiousness and his insults. Uh, but really, I mean, throughout the film, you see that it's it's so subtle. He did it so beautifully. It's so uh, he's he's scared until it just boils up and, you know, really yeah. explodes. Uh, so I, 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 you know, it really reminded me of something you would have seen perhaps in the 70s being made, you know, an unlikable lead uh, self-destructive character. Uh, so this was, you know, to see this in the eighties, a decade of such, you know, blockbuster was, right. um, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I know the reviews were really good. I'm not surprised that, uh, the, the box office wasn't as good. Um, you know, because it, it certainly wasn't anything Oliver Stone had done before. That's and right. it certainly wasn't really much of what you were seeing at that time. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really, uh, wonderfully done. Did you, did you, uh, how did you end up getting this part? How did the part come to you? Well, if I remember, um, so I would have been early twenties, I guess, like 21, 22 or something when I did that movie. So at the time I was, you know, a regular kind of auditioning actor among probably thousands, you know, in LA at the time of women of a certain age or young women of a certain age. And, um, I at the time would would be if there was a part for a, a a female under the age of 25 at the time me and all my colleagues would be marched out I'm sure to audition for that I do remember the audition though I do remember that it was Oliver and Eric in the room and I do remember <laughs> it was a big room I do remember feeling um emboldened because even in that meeting Oliver was kind of sassy and sort of provocative and all those things. And 
um, I remember then that I was, uh, I did not feel intimidated by him, which was unusual because he was, he was obviously a super well-known filmmaker at the time. And um, I didn't really know who Eric was, but I do remember sort of giving it back to Oliver in that audition. And I do remember auditioning with that scene that's, that's in the movie where um, Barry Champlain's, where Eric Bogosian's wife calls Ellen Green calls um, and feeling bold about it. There was some gag in the audition that his character was peeing as he was on the phone. And I remember standing behind him as if I was standing behind him while he was taking a pee over the toilet. I remember all these sort of strange <laughs> pieces of it. Um, so that's what, you know, that's what I remember now. Um, I was also working at the time kind of in that circuit, but it was certainly a big deal to get that movie. But that same year, within that year, I did a movie called Kansas with Matt Dillon and Andrew McCarthy and another movie called It Takes Two with George Newbern. So all of those movies were kind of really jammed up together and It Takes Two actually also shot in Dallas. Um, oh. So off, off I go to Dallas, whatever that is, 87, I guess, we probably were there. Um, and then I got nervous because then it was the way the movie was scheduled. It was me and all those dudes. Ellen Green was sort of separate from the work that I was doing. Right. Um, and so we, I was with all those guys and I remember, you know, they were all well-known theater actors. They're all New Yorkers, all kind of tough guys, even though they're all super nice guys, but it was, and I, you know, not only was I Canadian, but living in LA and I can remember feeling like, oh man, these guys are like all real actors. And I'm not an actor. Like I just, I'm just here. I, I recognize that I'm like, here is the girl. And how am I ever gonna like keep up with these guys? And um, Oliver, in his astuteness, was always so, uh, so quick to recognize what your fear was, or what your sort of secret thing that you didn't want anyone to know. He would just know. And uh, I remember him saying to me one day at work. You know, you're you're a wallflower compared to all these guys. I mean, you're just being blown off the screen by all these guys. They're all real actors and New Yorkers, and you you know, you better get on with it, or you're you're not even going to end up staying in the movie. And oh, I remember God. this all these years later because he, you know, he is abrupt and tough that way. And I remember saying to him, "Well, you won the Academy Award. Why don't you pull it out of your ass and use it?" So <laughs> good for you. Did. Yeah. <laughs> Now, inside my heart's going like crazy, and inside I think everything he's saying is true, but outside um, I gave him a bit of the what for. I, can, I do remember that. And those actors were great. They were yeah. fantastic, you know, every, everybody. Johnny McGinley, Michael Wincott's exceptional, Alec Baldwin, of course, Johnny Panko, like those, and of course, Bogosian. Yeah. Um, these guys were so good and so in the pocket. Yeah. Oliver was right. I was out of my league. Um, but I looked at it, when I looked at it the other night, I was like, I'm still proud to have been a, there, you know, a part of it. What, why do you feel that you, when you say, you, oh, well, I, I, you felt as if you weren't a real actor, why, do you, why did you feel that way? Well, I, you know, I'd sort of fallen into acting. I did my first movie when I was 16. I was in boarding school. So I, I wasn't anybody that, like, came to acting as a, um, I certainly had wanted to do it. I was interested in it, but I wasn't somebody who'd gone to theater school or had grown up really as a kid actor. I had no, no, nothing about uh, film or television for that matter. So I'd gone from that movie to, as you know, the Cassavetes movie down in, down in LA. And I'd been sort of fumfering around there for a couple of years and I'd been working, but I wasn't like a trained actor, I hadn't uh, put in that kind of time. I was putting in, I was, you know, earning as I learned, I was putting in the time working, right. on being hired to go to work, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I mean, I, I it took me years to figure out how it was supposed to go. So, I, and I was aware of that even then, like uh, that I was lucky to be places that I was in, that I was lucky to be surrounded by those kind of actors and filmmakers and, the DP, like Bob Richardson, like all that stuff. I knew I was lucky to be there, but um, I also knew as well that uh, I wasn't qualified yet. If stuff was happening, it would be an accident or because I'd been helped or um, I had a, a lucky day or something, but I wasn't totally in control yet or understanding of 
kind of what the job was. I mean, the deep part of the job. I don't mean hitting my mark and being on time and learning my lines. I knew how to do that. But I mean the sort of deeper kind of emotional, authentic work that an actor should be doing. I was just like stumbling along trying to figure it out. So, um, well, if that's the, I mean, if that's the case, you certainly at least fooled me. I mean, it, I mean, because I, I actually <laughs> thought it was uh, uh, such a great uh, performance because it's you know this this guy is really taking advantage uh, of you and treating you so badly, and I can see how you don't you there was a there was that one scene where you do say something, but often yeah. you're letting him do it, and I can see how much it was bothering you. Yeah. Uh, and is like the scene where the next morning when his wife calls, uh, his yeah. ex-wife calls uh, in the morning when you're at his at his place, uh, and even later on hearing uh, when she uh, Ellen when Ellen calls and says that she loves him uh, as he's working on the phone, and then he cuts to you, uh, which is a, a beautiful reaction of you, it's just looking down, and I could see how that was that was hurting you. Uh, so, like I said, I mean, I I thought I thought you were really it was a really subtle and strong role of performance i thought it was really so if you didn't know what you were doing you certainly fooled at least me <laughs> <laughs> that's what i called in today robert i wanted to have this little podcast so you could <laughs> you know, um, well thanks um yeah I mean, it's, what i take away from it watching it now is uh, i was just lucky to be there you know and especially with those with those actors man like i uh, i just i Watching Michael Wincott, you know, the other night, who plays the, the. Uh, you know, I the, never knew that was him. Yeah, I, I, I was like, who played that guy? And then, you know, because I've seen him in other films, and I, I've worked with people who have worked with him, and yeah, he's the other Toronto from Canada. I mean, yeah. he's remark. He's rem I couldn't he's recognize him. No, he's yeah. extraordinary, and I, I don't. I'm not sure of this, but I think he may have played the part on stage. I don't know that for sure. He did, yeah. Oh, did he? He did, um, and so did John C. McKinley. Yeah, yeah, and those guys. I mean, those those guys are. They're all great. Everybody, everybody was. All those guys were just fantastic in the movie. But I just was sort of flooded with love for Wincott when I saw what he was doing. The the balls that a young actor would have to do that. You know. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a play. It's a movie. Yeah. And that kind of sort of exuberance. Um, into that small space that we were working in. I thought he was awesome. All of them, actually, all of them. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, uh, he was really, uh, I, I, when you say that you felt that that was a ballsy performance, did, are you, because it was, it was not large in the sense that it's over the top, but it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's really the guy's bold. pretty out there. <laughs> he is out there, it's bold, you know, he's in a full wig, his costume's kind of outrageous, like, it's a committed character that he's playing. Yeah. And um, he, the actor, committed to it so determinedly. I thought it was it was great. McGinley too. John McGinley who plays the um, the engineer in there. Yeah, Stu. Right, Stu. Yeah, I love McGinley. He's just so great. And also him with all his his little quirks, you know, with the phone around the back of his neck and his gestures of doing <laughs> sort of freedom yeah. to 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 do what he did it was great. Now he had at the time, McGinley um, who played Stu, he'd worked with Oliver already. So he had- Yeah, he was um, in Platoon. That's right. And he had a, a better understanding of, of what that experience could be like, I think. So he was, he was bold in a way too, but I think emboldened by having been there before with Oliver, who uh, yeah. was a you know, strong personality to be working with. You, we, you you said something interesting earlier uh, about Oliver in the audition. You 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 really clicked onto the sense that he was trying to provoke you. And when you say that didn't phase you, uh, do you think that's because of your your experience at boarding school dealing with those kind of? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably more from my experience at home. But yeah, boarding school too. I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot lately as I've you know I'm directing right and. The reality is still that I'm largely outnumbered gender-wise. Mm. So in boarding school, I went to boarding school in Victoria in, in British Columbia, and they were in their second year of accepting girls in a boys' school that had gone from grade 1 through 12. And they're accepting girls in grade 10 through 12. So just from 10, grade 10 through 12, the ratio of boys to girls was 6 or 7 to 1. And then there's all the other grades behind you that are all boys. And we had one female teacher for the entire school. And um, I, I, 
I do think now that that experience helped me perhaps not just on that movie, but certainly as a director um, of, of just dealing right. with that basic balance, the gender imbalance, you know, uh, but also, uh, you know, I grew up in a military family and um, I, I wasn't uh, inexperienced with, uh, let's say, uh, Men you know, screaming I, at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Aggressive behavior. Um, right. Not a lot of feelings were going to be talked about. Right, um, right. Films are run like military maneuvers most of the time, you know, with how things go. And there's an order and a hierarchy to things. So yeah. that part of it was something that was not not as difficult for me. That being said, you know, I, I'm a big believer in hierarchy. Now that I'm directing, I, I just, I don't believe in yelling. No yelling. No yelling. I don't think Oh, no, yeah. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Um, did, was there much rehearsal on this film since it was a yeah. stage play? Oh, there was, okay. So yeah, how long that the... Is, that was a really interesting part about this movie. And that is something that I've, an element of which I've tried to take forward as a director. So, uh, you know, and I can be fuzzy on the facts, but here's what I remember, is that it was a four week shoot for six day weeks, which at the time was sort of relegated to really small kind of low budgety type of movies, like cheapo movies were doing that kind of schedule. And even though Oliver at that point had done Platoon and Wall Street, uh, and he was a big deal, of course, um, this was considered a lower budget movie and more like a passion project for him or something sort of of interest. It wasn't, by definition, it wasn't gonna be a big, huge um, extravaganza kind of movie. So not only was it based on a play and not only were the actors, you know, not huge movie stars, right? That was part of the, how that the, it was put together. Um, he wanted to shoot it in 24 days and almost in continuity. So we ran those couple of nights of the radio show, which is in the movie, by rehearsing it. I want to. I think it was two weeks we had of rehearsal, like real rehearsal, include including by the time we went to camera to shoot. You know, the marks were on the floor for the blocking. That's what I remember that he. The camera, uh, Richard, Bob Richardson and some of the other crew guys, Bob Richardson, the DP, and some of the other camera department and other people were part of our rehearsal process in this, on the second of two weeks. So track was being laid, marks are being put down on the floor, and we rehearsed it kind of like a play, even though it had been done as a play. There was a lot of different right. elements to this. And a lot of access that you wouldn't have had in the play, I suppose, in terms of, you know, you could always see somebody on one end or the other of the... the where, the, where Barry Champlain is doing a show, you could see reflections, people moving in and out of spaces, like all of that choreography was done ahead of time. When you're drinking your coffee, when you're leaving the sounds to, I mean, the, the booth to go over to talk, you know, when my character's going over to talk to McGinley's character, where uh, Johnny Panko's standing, he plays the, um, the guy who's gonna buy the show and send it national, like all of that stuff had been not just rehearsed, but marked and we were shooting, um, we were shooting something we we knew pretty well in terms of the staging by the time we went to camera was it a full was it a full run through like the from beginning to end like a like oh so okay so he very much did it like a play that's wow. what i remember now i could be sort of you know gilding the lily there but i do, i have in my head that i was there for two weeks of rehearsal and wardrobe and everything else and four weeks of shooting okay um, and that was the big part, that that kind of rehearsal, I mean, it's impossible to get that now, certainly in television, but I suppose right. in film too. But that, just taking the time to rehearse enabled that show to to move quickly, which was very quick at the time, and um, efficiently, and um, with thought and planning, because we'd done real rehearsal ahead of time. Do you know if that was something Bogosian wanted to do? Or was that stone? I, that came, I would say that came from Oliver, and I'm, I don't know for sure. I'm sure because he wouldn't have said no to that. I mean, he didn't, we did it, but um, that I'm pretty sure that was uh, Oliver's idea in terms of the, the best way to shoot that. What was the, the most efficient way to get that thing shot in the amount of time he had? And at the time as well, I, I remember that it was considered very low budget because it was only six million. Um, yeah. And that seems crazy to me now, like six million now is something that is kind of healthy to do a small movie. But at the time it was considered really low, especially for all of someone like Oliver, you know? 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I actually read four million online. I don't know if it's four no, or six. Right. I could be getting my like, yeah, that's it could be right. It could be four million, which yeah, even wow. was um very low. Very low at the time and not so low now, if you think about it. Right. Do you so. uh was this was this hard to get off the ground for him because there wasn't any stars and because this wasn't something that you know, it wasn't a large scale like his other films. Uh, did, 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 did you ever find anything out about no, you know, why I, you know, it was so? I don't know. I mean, I, I would expect that his commitment to, and the play was very successful, right? And so Eric was sort of bursting out on the scene. I mean, he was already very well known in the New York circuit, I know, but so but he still wasn't a movie star. And, right. um, and Alec was known, but just, you know, kind of stepping into his own, Alec Baldwin. Ellen Green was known because of Little Shop of Horrors and probably other stuff as well. But everybody was sort of known within the community, but nobody was this huge movie star. And I expect it was Oliver and the producer, Ed Pressman, and I think it was Alex Ho's commitment to, to kind of maintain some of the authenticity of the play and the right. vital of the play by not casting heavy duty movie stars that could weigh the whole thing down. Um, yeah. It's hard to imagine that anybody but Eric would would do that. I know. I think Leif Schreiber ended up doing a reboot of the play in New York, but I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah. I I, I was fortunate to see it in two thousand and seven because uh, yeah. I was I was there, and I thought the same thing. I thought there's no way anyone other than Bogos Bogosian can do that part as effective, and I was actually shocked at how it was very different, very very different, yeah. but really really good. Uh, I've always loved the play. I've seen I've seen a couple of productions of it, but he did a phenomenal. He he showed more of the the fear as opposed to Bogosian uh -huh. was was a was more um, subtle until that monologue happened. With him, you can see it. You know, he was almost popping pills, and it was a uh -huh. little it was a little different. It was a little more um, stuck out a little more. Uh, but it was very. Did you ever did you ever see any uh, production of the play? No, I mean, when the play would have been probably, let's say a couple of years before the movie in real terms. And so I would have been, what, 19 or something just in LA. I hadn't even been to New York. I'd never even visited New York at that point. So <laughs> I, mean, I, I knew about when I got that job, I started to, of course, look into like, who was I working with and all that stuff. But I was not part of that scene at all. So I wouldn't, right. I just know that everybody was fancy and from New York and I wasn't. That's what I knew at the time. <laughs> Was it just the one audition or did you have a few callbacks? Well, it seems to me at that time it would have been more than one. I mean, to, to meet with Oliver would have been the final version. Um, and I'm sure I went through casting a few times and, you know, worked my way up into um, actually meeting, reading with Eric and with Oliver there. Um, but I don't know, you know, it's funny now. It's like, geez, the, I don't remember the lead up to it. I just remember the the meeting with Oliver. And you know what? I could be completely conflated. I was saying all this. I said, I wonder if I'm conflating that with, because I did meet him again on, is it The Doors maybe? On uh, some other movie later. But that no, you auditioned? That you yeah. auditioned for? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, now I think about, no, it was definitely, it was for, for Talk Radio that um, that story comes from. It's a long time ago, Robert. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess they would have, this came out in 88. So I imagine it was shot either early that year or late 87. I think it was 87 because yeah. what I remember is that it was hot out. So it probably was the summer of, of um, 87 and you know, it's film, right? It wouldn't have, it, the post process wouldn't have been as fast as it is nowadays. And right. uh, they did, um, they did have the actors there who were playing the the radio callers. They did have them there. I do remember that that they oh. were brought in. I'm sure they did some re-recording, but that they were brought in as part of the cast. So um, they would phone in, you know, for while we were shooting. They were in another room somewhere, and as you probably saw from the credits, uh, some of them played more than one character. And yeah, it wasn't the play. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I didn't realize that uh, some of the, it was mixed up. Uh, for example, uh, even Michael Wincott, he had played a couple of uh, the callers yeah. 
as well, yeah. uh, which I which I didn't know. Uh, just looking at your character, Laura, um, was when you were playing this part, did did you ever wonder why she was putting up with him and not, you know, leaving or or leaving the no, job at least? It's like I look at it now and. Um, I, I recognize there's a bit of a trope there, you know, like this younger woman and slightly older guy and stuff, but I don't remember feeling like downtrodden or in any way victimized by the character. It was in any way victimized by it. She's just young and That's loved right. if really like the guy. And, you know, I think we can all probably relate to one of those kind of relationships where yeah. it's never going to work out, but it's, it doesn't have to be, horribly abusive to just not be a good relationship, right? Or not a balanced relationship. But, you know, she, that character was too young, I think, to fully recognize the depths of Barry Champlain's, well, let's just say it, fucked up in this. Um, she's yeah. just too young to really get what that all was. I mean, she's optimistic, right? She's just optimistic that if he could just be nicer, if he could just be better paid, if he could just be his better self, then everything would be okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't think she's fully, you know, she's not a fully formed person yet, which is probably very capable, uh, but just not in that department. Um, That's what I thought as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did what, you know, what, what was he like as a director in terms of, did he, was every take, did he give you a different direction? Did he want variation or did he just let you have full reign for the, of the role? Well, you know, the thing I was thinking about this as a, obviously as we were getting to talk about it. Um, John McGinley said to me about Oliver, and he played Stu. He said, you know, Oliver's way of directing is like, it goes, sorry, I don't know how to get rid of that. Oliver, That's okay. Oliver's, way, um, Oliver's way of directing is. It's like going to the dentist. You sort of pries open your mouth. <laughs> you know the are starts drilling with no oh, anesthetic, no Novocaine, oh. films the reaction and nothing this would does make not him sound good. <laughs> yeah. So once you sort of understand that, that his assessment of your, you know, your pain points, your vulnerability or your weakness um, is what he wants to get into and photograph basically, mm. um, his comfort or your upset or, you know, things that put you off balance. Um, that's sort of how he put on Marion. That's how he works. Now, with all of us, meaning us younger actors and a lot of big personalities, but but younger actors, um, I feel like, and I could be wrong about this, I feel like probably for me, he would be asking me to do stuff again to try and get to something authentic or real, but he wouldn't he wouldn't be doing a million takes with me because I didn't hit a mark or something he but he was all uh, he seems to me he was looking for stuff that was um had pathos in it and feeling and authenticity and discomfort and not all not beautiful and so I would I would expect that th that would be why there were more takes but I don't remember it being like a Kubrick sort of thing where we we're doing like 100 takes or something for something you didn't know why you were doing it again because we'd also rehearsed right. and rehearsed with camera, there was a smoothness, as I recall, to the kind of blocking and the fluidity of, of how that went that also wouldn't have warranted a gajillion takes, but it was technically challenging. You know, there's these circular dollies that were set up. There were very specific lighting cues to work within that radio space. And I expect that there was technical things that required um, more than one take, but I don't remember it being um, something egregious or crazy. I just do remember being uh, scared, um, you know, like about not doing well, like what I said before about not living up to the New York actors of being sassy with Oliver, of being surrounded by all those dudes. I mean, like I said, I wasn't working with Ellen, so it was just me and all those guys and you know, of course, a couple of female crew members, but, and I, I was young for that group. I think it was, like I said, 20 or 21. Yeah. And, uh, now I think about it, if I had a 20 year old daughter, I'd be like, no fucking way are you gonna go do that? Um, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't have somebody say that, so I went to go do it.
Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. I mean, how did you, you know, when you, when you, was there anything you did to, to help with that anxiety or was it just a matter of, well, I'm just going to get through it. <laughs> you know, um, to this day, one of my closest friends is a uh, fellow Canadian, um, Nadine Vanderveld, and she's a terrific, she was an actor at the time, but she's a terrific uh, writer and producer now, a showrunner. And she was and is one of my closest friends. And I remember I had pictures of actually of her and Alec and us together at sort of parties and stuff that she came out to, to stay with me. Because there were a few times when I was like, I don't know, man, it's pretty crazy here. And she, uh, she came out as like friend, guardian, pal. So, um, for some support, yeah, I can imagine that would be crucial. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, you know, it's, I mean, even if it weren't the 80s, the fact is, you know, it was Oliver and it's all those young guys and there's just a kind of an energy about that, a kind of tough guy energy that Oliver also kind of, you know, instigates and, and foments on, on the show, at least he did then. And uh, it, it was, it's a navigation to get through it. It was a navigation as a young woman. Um, now yeah. it would probably be easier. And I don't remember being like um, uh, so distraught that I had to like run away from home kind of distraught. Just remember thinking I have to keep my, I got to keep my guard up at all times, which is not necessarily the best thing for acting, but I, I had to be defended and at the ready for shit to go down. Cause it, yeah. it felt like working with those guys, like at any moment, something crazy could happen. Something could go sideways. Somebody could like blow a gasket. Somebody could get in a fight. Somebody like it was that kind of male um, confined energy was, I think something he, he, uh, he created in a way and certainly perpetuated for that movie. It was right for that movie to be kind of on edge and not know what was going to happen. And people are, you know, losing their temper at, you know, at the slightest provocation, all the stuff that's in the movie was a little bit of the atmosphere. I think he was trying to create. Now you can talk to somebody else from the show, like Johnny Panko. He might say, are you kidding? That was, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know, it's, I mean, as I said earlier, I mean, Alec Baldwin in his memoir uh, said he hated him. Stone <laughs> hated working with Stone, uh, that he would, something along the lines of he would throw his mother down his flight of stairs in order to get, to get the <laughs> shot right. Uh, I mean, I also read him, Bogosian and Stone had some, you know, d differences with the script and they co-wrote the script together. Were, were, were they also at each other's throats uh, or were they mostly I cordial? I don't remember that as much as I do remember that, uh, you know, I told, told you that story about McGinley saying, you know, Oliver is like going to the dentist and he wants to, you know, film the reaction as he's drilling your yeah. own and his ties oh, gum. Um, I do remember that Eric at the time, his, uh, his concern, he was, I might have this wrong, but that it was either about, uh, I think it was about the script per se, that's what it was. So Eric had written this very successful play, you know, and now he's doing a big deal movie, which could be a total game changer for him. Um, and Oliver's a big deal. And I do remember them arguing about a script or some of the dialogue and stuff. And, and I do remember Oliver, you know, provoking him in the same way that he would with any of us, like whatever his thing was, if it, it was like, I don't know if this, I don't know what he said. He goes, I don't know if the script works. We're about a week or so, and he's like, I don't know if this script is working at all, actually. Like, okay, so you're the actor who's carrying this role that you've created uh, for, the, for the theater, you've converted it into a screenplay with Oliver Stone, you're a week into shooting, no going back. And the yeah. director, your collaborator, your colleague, in theory, your supporter is like, I don't think this is working. I mean, I would have blown my brains out. <laughs> I just don't know how Eric did it. But I think, again, it was part of this atmosphere that Oliver was creating of, you know, that everybody was just kind of on edge. Um, I don't it's know. Very, very Machiavellian of him. Is it? It's yeah, very. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but man, the movie's really good. And I don't know what yeah. Oliver would do now. And it's, you know, again, I was 20 or 21 or whatever when I did that movie. So my perception of it then, I am guarantee you, would be very different if I were to step onto that set today and see how things were going and what I would notice, uh, what I would recognize, what I would not put up with what I would think right. was totally fine, 
you know, that I'm sure there's lots of stuff that then that I maybe upset me now I'd be like, whatever. Um, you know, I see that now when I work with young actors, like what gets them riled up or excited about something like, it'll be fine. Um, so, and I wonder what Eric would say now, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know if he would, how he would talk about it now. How, how did you get along with him, with Bogosian? I loved him. I still love him. I, you know, I, um, and you worked uh, with him again after that, right? Was it Law, yeah. law and Order? Was it Law and Order? It was Law and it was, Order. Okay. Um, law and Order, see, a criminal intent. Yeah. So um, I loved him. I thought he would, well, one, I just thought his writing was exceptional. And I was so impressed with his acting work. And he's, I didn't a, have, he's so good. He's so terrific. He's great. He's yeah. so terrific and so watchable. And um, I, I have a great fondness for him still, but I remember at the time too that I'm sure we were trading stories at the time about being nervous or unsure about some of the stuff we were doing. And he was so open and um, kind and um, you know, just good to me. And then years later, when I went to work with him on Law and Order, I remember, because he looks the same, right? And uh, it was like, whatever he was and we did the movie I guess in his 30s and now it's whatever he's in his 50s or something and um I remember saying before I went to go see him I said okay so here's the here's the deal fair warning like it's gonna make you feel really old when you see me because <laughs> I look you know I was 20 and I'm nowhere near 20 30 is much closer to 50 than 20 is to 40 right like so <laughs> like just be ready because it's gonna be hard for you Eric you know <laughs> I'm sure when I got to go see him, it was like this, you know, this moment you have of like, they're that much older. That means I'm that much older. And I totally saw it on his face. It was really funny. But anyway, oh, he, uh, he was lovely in, uh, he was lovely as he always was on Law and Order. And I really enjoyed being with him again. And funny enough, I had, when I was acting, I had that scene from talk radio that you're talking about in the bedroom. And I had a scene from Law and Order, both with Eric, that I had those on my acting demo reel. On your reel, yeah. Years right. past the yeah. expiration date, right? Because I, I liked work and I, I like those scenes and all that stuff. So Eric's been with me, whether he knew it or not, for a long time. Oh, wow. that's <laughs> I love that story. Yeah, he's... Uh... He's a phenomenal actor. I don't know. Did you did you see Uncut Gems uh, a couple yes. of years ago? Yeah, he's great. Yeah, no, he's so great. He's phenomenal. Yeah, uh, he's Wonderland great. is another film he with Val Kilmer. Uh, just a, a really an incredible talent. Uh, what about Alec Alec Baldwin? Did you uh, work? There wasn't too much dialogue between the two of it you, wasn't but too much uh, with him. But we were always all together, right? Because the right. nature that that set up with those glass walls for the radio station was such that we always had to interact whether we were actually talking to each other or not. And I had known him from before because one of my first gigs in LA after Cassavetes from high to low was doing Nuts Landing. And um, oh, he right. played his like tardy, slutty waitress girlfriend or affair or something, I can't remember. But like I had, I was his love interest for a, six or seven episodes or something on, on Nuts Oh, Landing. I didn't know that. Yeah, so on that, I would have been 18 or something or 19. So not that long before I'd worked with him on Knott's Landing, from Knott's Landing to uh, talk radio. So I knew him going into it. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he's probably everything that you'd expect that you see now. He's super, like, big personality, really funny, really quick. Um, I, I thought fit right into Oliver's world perfectly. That kind of growly guy energy that he had. Oh yeah. He, he was, um, at the time he was, uh, he was clean and sober and he was sort of open about that, that it was, it had been a struggle and it was now no longer. Um, so, you know, he was, as far as I could tell all, you know, well-behaved in that department, but it was a fresh, sobriety that's what i remember could be true, yeah. not true he might say that's not true but um so he kind of had that vibrating energy all the time but i when i watched it the other night it was like man that guy's got confidence just coming out his yeah butt, right he just takes over and he'd had success for sure at that point but he wasn't 
as well. He wasn't some like mega huge movie star. Not yet. Uh, took over. Right? Yeah. You know, it's really. Yeah. Yeah, because that was this was like right before Beetlejuice and yeah. um, Married to the Mob. I think he had eighty eight. I think was a big nineteen eighty eight was a big year for for him. But yeah, you're right. He he is even in his uh, memoirs quite open about what you were saying his uh, addiction at that time and uh, starting fresh and coming out of it. So uh, no, I, well, you know, I'm, I'm relieved to hear at least you got along with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the rest of the cast. Well, uh, I love even in, yeah. yeah, I love them. I love them. I love John McGinley. Love Johnny Panko. Love Michael Wincott. I mean, I just, they were just, they were such good boys, men, whatever, you know, they were great. And they were, um, they were good to me. Um, now I look good, back good. and think, well, to them, I must have, it was true. I was sort of new and um, to them, I must have seemed really knew, you know, like, yeah. because they all had more experience than me. And again, some of them with Oliver, but um, yeah, I just, I love them all in a different way. I mean, just, they were, they were good, good boys. And uh, I, I saw um, McGinley, God, I can't remember. I, like, I don't know how or why I saw him. And he's exactly the same. It was, I don't know, it's maybe 10 years ago or something. That that thing that you love about somebody that you know you really re respond to and whatever it is about them that makes you laugh and all that all that stuff is the same when I ran into him. Yeah. Well, that no, that's that that's good to hear because there's nothing worse than hearing like you know I've always loved this film. There's nothing worse than hearing than than hearing that the whole thing was a nightmare <laughs> and everyone was an asshole or something. So it was hard. Yeah. And it was yeah. Challenging and uh, it was intense. And, uh, but it was, it was a, a really sort of unique and special experience. And I, uh, like I said, when we started, like, I'm, I feel now proud to have been a part of it. I was happy to have the, you know, that for you to instigate me to look at it. Cause I literally haven't looked at it since it came out. Um, and you know what, here's another little small thing that I was thinking about, I was looking at all those. So, um, Zach Grenier, who's in that, he plays, I think he does some of the voices too, but he is um, one of the radio guys who's just coming off the air as Eric's oh. on. Not the, in, not in the, the flashbacks, you mean? Not in the flashbacks. I don't think it's in the flashbacks. Maybe it is when he go, he's got a very specific voice that talks about going home. And his name is Zach Benier. It, he, I work with him again later on. Oh, um, OK. Yeah, I'll, I'll look it up quickly. I think I know who you mean. Um, but the, the really special person in there too is Rockets Red Glare, who plays the killer, who's hanging out. Oh right, and, yeah, yeah. And so the very first film I ever directed, like when I was just trying to figure out how to do stuff, and um, this is when I was running my theater company. It's a little black and white um, silent film, sort of shot in that style, and Rockets is in it, um, playing this uh, sort of swooning um, mandolin playing guy who's in love with the unattainable woman. I'll send it to you actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Rockets is also, he's, he's no longer with us Rockets, but man, yeah. he's a very special person that was part of that. Yeah, and 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 so that, that, that ending is so terrifying. And, you know, because I know, because in the play, of course, he doesn't get killed. Uh, yeah. But this was also, for anyone who doesn't know watching, this was also based on the Al Alan Berg, who was killed yeah. by uh, white nationalist neo Nazis, uh, and it's it's incredible that they saw a memoir that was so was so much this guy, uh, yeah. Barry Champlain, and then to have Howard Stern, like all these things, sort of um, came together at, at that time. Did Did you ever read the book? Was that something they like sort of wanted everyone yeah, to do? Was, that yeah. That Oliver was really great at was um, he had actually Aneth who had worked with Alan Berg and been uh, part of that book I believe um, she was there as one of our technical advisors and somebody else and I'm forgetting their name but um, Oliver was insistent and dedicated to real prep and real um, uh, real research and always had technical advisors for everything you could possibly imagine like in a radio station, how do I turn this button on? When would I go for coffee? 
when do you get a bathroom break? Like any sort of like character kind of nuance and stuff, there was always someone there to ask a question of. Um, and I understood that he was like that on all of his movies, that he did, yeah. he did not fool around with that stuff. So he's a real- Yeah, I've read that. Yeah. And that was great to have and great to know as a younger actor, like, hey man, you gotta do this kind of work. Um, so yes, at the time I read that book, we all did. Um, it was sort of like required, you know, like, yes, you need to read this book. You need to do this thing. You need to look at these things. They would send you stuff to read or to listen to. And so all the materials you could imagine, stuff that you would do on your own now, that was provided and you were expected to do that work. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have to read that book because it sounds uh, sounds quite in intriguing. Did you, yeah. Do you remember uh, how you remember. felt about the book? Okay. Yeah, I don't remember much about it now. I, th I think it was mostly like uh, just, it, and frankly, it was all part of a bigger kind of research that we were doing. I mean, everything from how, like I said, how a radio station works to how do you work in a radio station. Um, so all of that, and we went to radio stations um, that Oliver arranged for that with the tech advisors there in um, Dallas. So that was that was pretty special actually to have those resources available to us and our boss, you know, Oliver saying, and learn this stuff. Like I expect you to do this. So you had to learn exactly all the act. I was wondering about that when, you know, yeah. seeing you with the, on the switchblade and stuff. So you oh, actually yeah. knew what you were doing. Yeah. Okay. You couldn't do it now. I can't remember any of it now, but <laughs> you really see it in McGinley, right? In John McGinley plays yeah. so you see his ease with that. And that was from, you know, doing that work and practicing and um, having real advisors show us how to do it. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, I was I was wondering about that because everyone seemed like you said everyone seemed so at home. I yeah. was wondering if he actually, you know, had you all learn that as he did with you know Platoon. I think they all went through you know like yeah. rigorous um, training, you know, military training and uh, and stuff like that. There, there's there's a really there's something that stood out to me when I was watching it is in that that monologue which is of, of course is also in the play uh about y you are sort of being entertained by our own lives and how you know he was sort yeah. of um he was sort of repulsed by that barry champlain and it's i, I don't know if that popped out to you but that it, that, that is really so true i mean there is this sort of um i remember when donald trump won in 2016 i think Stephen Colbert said, I think we all uh, like the poison taste, uh, 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 you know, giving out poison to each other to the taste of like the venom of uh, uh, us versus you in terms of yeah. uh, politics being almost like a, a game. Um, and I thought I hadn't really thought of it that way before. And, you know, people got are, you know, even when that scene at the basketball game, everyone is uh, that one when that woman approaches you and I watch his autograph, but he says she hates the show. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. That piece, yeah. that, you know, that little scene was so um, um, emblematic of what the movie was about to me. Like, yeah. I hate you. And everyone and, booing him and stuff. And, everyone, you know? yeah. and, and it, you know, this woman hated him so much, but there was more value to her in talking to him and throwing a beer in his face and expressing exactly yeah and not like it, it that thinking or that way of sort of interacting with somebody that you don't agree with or you hate for whatever reason that is so um in the truest sense of the word contemporary right or, yeah or modern in a way and um again really prophetic of, for, for where we're at now it yeah and it's just it's enveloped the whole country uh, and the states you know enveloped that whole country elsewhere i'm sure too but particularly in the states well yeah. that you, that really popped out to me and i know uh, uh <laughs> i don't know about you but i have in the past you know found myself um not being able to stop a fight on on facebook uh, over mm -hmm. and then and almost as if an, an addiction keeping you up to go back and forth over yeah. i'm like why am i doing this yeah. <laughs> now I don't do. I don't post any. I don't go anywhere uh, uh, politically on uh, uh, on social media because it just it's just back and forth that blocking yeah, yeah. and and uh, wow. I mean, you're right. I mean, in the '80s, it would have been these these uh, these talk show uh, radio shows, and you know, is, is that really the guy, or is he putting on a total act, or it's a combination of the two? You know, even when you, you think of someone like Tucker Carlson now, like, is that him? Is it somewhat him? 
or is it a performance? You know, it's it's entertainment. Uh, the news becomes entertainment. I thought, wow. Um, it, it, I, I thought he must have done that intentionally, but I, I don't know if he ever discussed this with you, Bogosian. But in interviews at that time, he said he was he was fascinated by that, but it was more just about this guy who his need for an audience, his need yeah. for love. And he doesn't yeah. know how to love anybody, but he needs that to be fed that uh, attention in, in this entertainment. And uh, sorry, I didn't catch. What was that? I, I missed that. This insatiable need to be fed that kind yeah. of. So b better to go to a basketball game and have some drunk woman tell you how much she hates you and throw beer in your face than not be known, right? Yeah. That's better. Um, and uh, it, better to be booed by all those people, even though you see in the film that it's uh, unsettling for him, yeah. than not invited to the basketball game in the first place. Um, That's you know, right. It's really like a sort of bizarre product of this, this past, what, 50 years or something, right? That that notion is so weird. Um, it is, yeah. It's, it's, we, that, that's why I find him so fascinating. And I've always, like I said, I mean, I've, o I, I've worked on uh, some, I mean, I have uh, the, the play here. With, actually, all um, Bogosian's, uh, <laughs> Bogosian, this is a, a book of Bogosian's uh, uh, one-man one monologues and, uh, and, and some other plays. And, and I, I think now it's kind of coming full, you know, full circle as to what has fascinated me. Because on the one hand, it's what he wants, but on the other hand, he hates how it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. this, you know, it, 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 you know, it's sort of like, you know, Do Donald, Donald Trump wants that attention, but he hates the, he hates the way he's getting it, yeah. but yet it, it keeps, it keeps uh, uh, going on. Cause it's, it's, it's the only option. Uh, and I mean, wow. I mean, that's just, um, it's quite remarkable how he, how he designed it in that sense. It's just such mm -hmm. a phenomenal film. And I, I really don't, and I really don't know why it's something that with Oliver Stone's fi filmography, it is, uh, you know, you hear JFK, you hear Platoon and people nix in his political ones. But this this is one of those hidden gems that just hasn't really had its due, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, like I said, I'm really pleased that you asked me to do this because it, it made me watch the movie again. And um, yeah. I, uh, I mean, it's hard to be entirely outside of it because it was in it and it's attached to sort of personal memories as well. But I was so impressed with the film when I watched it the other night and so impressed with Oliver and what he was doing, what he is doing, and certainly with, with Eric, right? That he was creating that kind of work at that time and, and continues to do, you know, really cool and interesting things. But just uh, what a fresh voice he would have been then a really important voice you know what what uh, eric's i mean um and and i don't know either why it it never quite landed because i too think the movie's really good really good yeah i agree well i wouldn't be surprised if this is a criterion collection release one day or um somehow come uh, you know it's it's so common that these uh, old hidden gems you know, years later will pop up and everyone will say, wow, that movie was, uh, uh, you know, something else. Uh, yeah. There's just, uh, I, I should have mentioned earlier, if people had any questions, feel free to uh, drop it in the comment box because Kubrick Lover 1972 was saying hello <laughs> to uh, to me. We, we mentioned Kubrick earlier, uh, briefly yeah. with uh, 100 takes. Uh, well, just lastly, uh, off topic, uh, what, uh, what are you, working on uh, now, I, I know you were directing on the television show, but you were gonna do this film called The Swearing Jar, right? That's right, so I am no longer, It's but it is happening right now. I was uh, slated to do that movie la last, yeah, last year. I was up in Toronto for, um, for the opening of Lie Exposed and we were um, hurtling towards prep on Swearing Jar and uh, uh, well, I'll just say it. Telefilm had dragged their feet for two years, and then all of a sudden the money dropped, and they were ready to go right away. And I couldn't. I was oh. slated to go do um, actually work out here in Vancouver. So the the movie pushed forward with I forget her name, Lindsay, the new director who directed Wet Bug, 
Um, is it Lindsay McKay? I'm so sorry that I just said her name. I'm not sure I said her name right. Patrick Adams from Suits is in it. Um, Jane oh. Lohman, who was the producer who was on from the beginning, is is has shepherded it through. Kathleen Turner is playing mom. Oh and, wow! Yeah. Um, so they're ha I think they're shooting literally right now as we speak. But in my world, I've been I'm here, like I said, directing on Snowpiercer in Vancouver. I'm very happy to be doing three episodes here. And um, just did Star Trek in Toronto, Strange New World Star Trek as a director. And right. I'm trying putting together a, a small film company with Tina Vakalopoulos that I produced like exposed with and called Parallela Pictures. And we have several projects in development and are looking. Oh, great. Yeah, our first feature we're going to take out probably within the month, see if we can get that up and running. And then I um, I directed uh, some music videos of a young singer-songwriter named Christina Apostolopoulos. So oh. I've been in that, I've never done them before. And I produced with Tina too, and I directed one. And uh, that was super fun. Talk about, that's great. Uh, yeah, just want, getting to do your own thing. That was really great. Yeah, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm up to. Yeah, you're right. The swearing jar, yes, Lindsay McKay, uh, that's right. Yeah, is now uh, directing it. Uh, okay, that's awesome. And for anyone uh, watching, we all, I also spoke to Leslie last year, uh, talking about her film that she was the lead in and also produced called Lie Exposed, which is uh, a really, really good Canadian film with her and Bruce Greenwood, which is uh, it's still that's still on all those same uh, streaming it's services. Well, you can still watch it on Apple TV or Crave and down south on Amazon and also on Apple TV. And uh, we're still hucking it. I'm I just love that little movie and um, it's Great. still available to be watched. So watch it. Yeah, go go check it out. And as we said at the top, uh, talk radio is is really is a little harder to find nowadays, but uh, it, I know in Canada it's on Hollywood Suite, which is I think through Amazon. Uh, but it, it's it's on uh, if you give it a Google search, it'll pop up. If you haven't seen it on, uh, I, I'm sure YouTube has it's a rent or buy perhaps, or you can get the physical uh, on DVD or Blu-ray. I know that's uh, a lot easier. Well, Leslie, again, uh, thanks so much. I always appreciate you giving me your time to talk about uh, your past. <laughs> well, yeah. I've, my, my ever-growing past, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> really now. There's like, we've gone as far back as I can go as an actor. Next time we'll do It Takes Two and Man at Work. <laughs> okay. Okay. Double bill <laughs> review. Double bill, uh, not likely to make the Criterion Collection. Just let's call it what it is. But um, yeah. I, I haven't seen either of them, but I, I've heard of them. Uh, so <laughs> I'll certainly check out. I don't know, man. You might want to stick to the more highbrow stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if I'm in the mood for it, I'll catch it one day. All yeah, right. All right. Well, thanks again. And for, th for those of you who are uh, watching and uh, commenting in the comment box, thanks so much. And if this is your first time on my uh, video podcast here, please consider subscribing by pressing the subscribe button, which you can find in the description box below, and then click the bell. And that way you'll get a notification every time uh, I release a new video or go live. And sorry, Ann Brown, There's uh, I worked at a theater in San Francisco showing talk radio. I love it. Nice to see you, Leslie. Is that someone you know, Ann Brown? Nice to see you. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, great. Well, thanks again, Leslie. And uh, we'll see everyone soon.